I want to start off this morning just asking you a personal question. So I, I want you to be honest with yourself, be honest with me. So when it comes to money, what are you good at? When it comes to money, what are you good at? I want you to think about that for a second. Be honest with yourself. When it comes to money, what are you good at? So I want to suggest maybe a few things that, that maybe possibly you might be good at. Um, maybe you're really good at spending. You are to shopping what Patrick Mahomes is to football. Click, click, click. Boxes are showing up at your doorstep and your spouse is like, is it Christmas again? Um, you, you spend so much that if you don't use your credit card for a week, the credit card company is calling you, asking for a wellness call, just making sure, hey, we're making sure you're all right because we're not seeing any spending. You're so good at spending that the UPS and FedEx man are your best friends. You have personal relationship with them. Or, or maybe, maybe, I would fall into this category, maybe you're good at bargain shopping. Like, I, we, my, Lisa and I, we love to go to Kansas City. We know where every single thrift store is in the KC metro area. We have probably been to every single one of them. You like going on Facebook Marketplace and you buy things that you don't even need because they are cheap, because you, you, uh, you need them. You, you, you want to you wanna save money that so much that you actually think Kohl's cash is real cash. That you go and you spend it. Yes, some are raising your hands. You understand Maybe, maybe you're really good at saving. Your grandparents, you've heard stories of, of maybe the Depression or some leaner times, and, and, and you're really good at saving. You don't trust the bank, so your, your mattresses are stuffed with cash. You're, you're really good at spending. Um, but here's the interesting thing, that there's not a single Bible verse that says the word to excel in shopping. There's not a single Bible verse that tells us that we should excel in bargain hunting. And there's not even a single Bible verse that tells us to excel at storing up treasures on this earth. But I would conclude with you by saying that there are several verses, there are plenty of verses in Scripture that tells us that we are to excel at giving. And so that's why we're in this two-week series called Enough. We're studying 2 Corinthians chapter 8, so if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn to that. And we're looking at what does it mean for us as followers of Christ to live a generous life. Last week, we looked at uh, the, the character of God, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave. Love gives. We're never more like the character of God when we give. We can't love without giving. That as disciples of Christ, we're called to have a, not to have a scarcity mindset, but a generous mindset. And there's two mentalities that we contrast last week. Uh, the bag mindset, where there's, there's just never enough. Or the barn mindset, where there's always enough. And as we've mentioned before, our heartbeat is, is not to ask for more. We're not asking for more. God has been so generous to us as a, a ministry and as a church in this season. We're not asking for more. But we truly believe, as I have seen it multiple times in my life, that when we live a generous life, there's some things that God gives us, some blessings, not necessarily monetarily, but things that, that we have seen God move in some powerful ways in our church, in our lives, and in our families. And so that is our desire for this series of Enough, is that you would experience the fullness of what God has for you. Because a lot of times, we kind of, we, we hold back. We, we'll say God, we say yes to God in, in every area of our life, but sometimes we hold back our finances to God. And so we'll continue again, uh, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 8, uh, verses 6 to 12. So if you're new to FSN, if you don't have a Bible, there should be one right in front of you. You'll find 2 Corinthians chapter 8 on page 791. We want you to follow along with us. And so if you weren't here last week, Paul is writing to the church in Corinth. And he's encouraging them to live generously, to give generously. Last week, he used uh, uh, the church of Macedonia as an example, who was extremely poor, who was experiencing all types of trials, but yet they were irrationally generous. Previously, the Corinthians had said they wanted to give, they planned to give, they, 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 they wanted to give, they planned to give, but somehow they stopped giving. They had good intentions but they didn't follow through. And so Paul is, is again, is encouraging them 
to continue on in their generosity. So 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6, it says this. So he urged Titus, just as he had earlier made at the beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. So if you have your Bible, if you have one of our Bibles, just simply underline that word grace. To bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. And as we looked at last week, there, there's multiple times in, in these, these groups of, of scriptures, Paul talks about the grace to give. In the New Living Translation, he say, we're sending Titus to encourage you and what you intend to do, encouraging you to finish this ministry of giving. I love what that says, to finish this ministry of giving. That, that giving is a spiritual thing. There's something powerful in, in, in our ability to be generous. It's just like any other ministry. Giving of itself is a ministry. That, that, that praying is spiritual. That fasting is spiritual. Reading your Bible is a spiritual thing. Going on missions trips, serving in FSN kids, especially in the preschool room, that is probably the most spiritual thing you can do here at FSN is to serve there. But don't forget, sometimes we forget that the act of being generous, the act of giving is a very spiritual thing. So Paul is calling to them. Finish the ministry of giving. You started, you had good intentions, but for some reason you stopped. Finish it. Finish the ministry of giving. Paul goes on in verse 7. But since you excel in everything, then he gives a list of things that, that the church in Corinth excels in. In faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, in the love we have kindled in you. So that you also excel in this grace of giving. Again, if you have your, your Bible, just simply underline the grace of giving. Paul is saying you've ex you're excelling in all of these things. Also excel in the grace of giving. Paul's commending them for their great faith. You have faith that can move mountains. You're a church that's full of, of great communicators. The, the ability to rightly divide the word of God, to the knowledge of scripture is incredible. You're so enthusiastic. I love being at your church. You're so enthusiastic in all things. You're love. You love so well, but you lack this one thing. Excel. And then you excel in so many good things, but also excel in giving. Be the most generous people in your city. I know you want to give. You have good intentions, but you don't. There, there's this gap between your desire and your actions. And I think many of us kind of fall into that category just like the Corinthian church. We want to be great at giving. We want to be generous. We have good intentions, but there seems to be this gap between our intentions and actually following through. And how many of us, if we're honest, have had the thoughts of being generous? We find ourselves in a situation where God prompts us to be generous, but we don't. As your pastor, I want to be honest with you. There was a several years ago where God had prompted me to be generous. I was in uh, G&W, so from the church to our house, we pretty much go past G&W. So if Lisa calls me, hey, pick up such and such, milk or eggs or whatever, uh, I'll swing by G&W. Well, there was one of those days a couple years ago that, that uh, um, I was in G&W, I had my cart, and there was a lady that was in there that I just, like, she, she, I caught notice of her. And so it seemed like every time uh, she was going down one aisle, I, I was going down another, other, the, other, the, the same aisle, the opposite direction. And so somehow I found myself behind her at the checkout line. And I, and I noticed something interesting that was going on. There wasn't a whole lot of stuff in her cart. But she was looking at the stuff in her cart, and she was looking at her hand, and she had a wad of cash in her hand. And I could tell that she was trying to decide if she had enough money for the stuff that was in her cart. And God just said, Virgil, why don't you, why don't you pay for her groceries? Do you think I did? haunts me today that I didn't. You know, we can make up so many excuses that, hey, there's this dude that wants to buy our groceries. He's, he's hitting on her. That, that's absolutely not true. Uh, we could come up with so many excuses of why not, but for some reason I didn't. 
and it still haunts me today. A couple months ago, back at GNW, I don't know if God's taking, talking to me to be like, every time you go to GNW, just plan on paying for somebody's groceries. I was paying for my groceries, and there was um, this lady that was behind me, and uh, she had a, a young son, and I'd, I'd seen them in the store kind of walking around, and the only thing she came up to the checkout was just a, a bag of, of uh, Little Debbie donuts. And God just said, hey, pay for her donuts. I don't, how much is donuts? Not very much. But I did. And it haunts me. There's so many times that God prompts us to do something that, that, that we don't. We are in Kansas City recently, and uh, we were at an intersection, and there's, there's a large, I would say, a, a fairly large home, uh, homeless uh, community in, in the Kansas City uh, area. And, and we were at an intersection. Across the way, there was a man holding up a sign. He wasn't asking for money. He wasn't asking for anything. He just said, simply said, smile on there. And the car drove up beside him and just simply handed him a baggie. And there was food in there. And I thought in my head, I'm like, man, I wish I could do that. And afterwards, it's like, what's stopping me? I didn't think that. I, I, just, I, I, I thought afterwards, I'm like, what's stopping me from doing that? What's stopping me from being generous? There's so many times that this Holy Spirit prompts us to be generous, to, to do good intentions, but we don't fall through, and we can think of all of the reasons why. Uh, pastor Craig Rochelle, he's a pastor I listen to a lot, and I've, I've heard him say this many times. In fact, as I was studying, I heard him say this again. He said, the devil will never tempt you to be generous. If you ever have to wonder, is the devil tempted to be generous? The answer is no. The devil will never tempt you to be generous. It's a prompting of the Holy Spirit when it comes to generosity. And if you're like me, you want to be generous. And Paul is writing to a church just like you and just like me. They want to be generous, but there's this gap between generosity, their desire, and falling through with generosity. And if you're like me, you you want to desire, you desire to be generous. You want to excel in generosity. But the one thing that we know is we don't become great at something by accident. I don't just sit down at the piano and just like play out Beethoven's Fourth Symphony. I have no idea if that's one or not. I don't know. Making it up. I'm not going to come sit down at the piano just and play it out. Like we don't accidentally just all of a sudden become a great piano player. Uh, We don't all of a sudden just wake up one day and be like, I'm going to go to the hospital and perform heart surgery. I just just think I have the knowledge to perform heart surgery, kind of like this guy. Sponge. How does everything look? Looks good. It's real good. What's his BP? 120 over 80. Okay, folks. Close him up. You're not Dr. Stewart. No. But I did stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. We're not going to stay at a Holiday Inn Express and just become great at being generous. We don't become generous by accident. Why is that? It's because we are selfish by nature. Never once did I ever have to sit down with my kids and teach them the word mine. It wasn't like at Trenton. Okay, when one kid wants your toy... You grab it back and you say, mine. Never once, but there was multiple times both of my kids did that. They they, they wanted the things. We're selfish by nature. It isn't just kids. We're adults also. Adults also are selfish. I'll give you an example. If we take a selfie as a group, what makes a picture good or not? How we look. The first person that we look at is ourselves. If everybody else looks great and we look bad, we're like, no, 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 we got to retake that picture. But if we look good and everybody else looks bad, we're like, hey, post that one on social media. We're, we're selfish. We're selfish by nature. We don't, we don't accidentally become generous. So how do we become great at being generous? We have to plan on uh, Isaiah chapter 32. Isaiah is speaking. It says, be generous people. But generous people plan to do what is generous. And they stand firm in their generosity. Generous people plan to do what is generous, and they stand firm in their generosity. If we want to have the character of God, because love gives, we're never more like God when we give. We don't become more like Jesus by accident. 
When it comes to our generosity, if we want to be like Jesus, we have to plan on it. Isaiah is saying is that generous people, if you want to be generous, you have to plan to be generous. And then stand firm in it. Stick to it. My wife is a planner. That, that's one of the things that, that, that has rubbed off on me. I'm still not a great planner, but she is a planner. So when we go on vacation, before we even leave the driveway, she has already had our vacations planned. Like most of the stops, most of the things that we're going to see, most of the things that we're going to experience. If we're going to the beach, she says, okay, on this day we're doing nothing. It's like she has every meal plan. There's m- most of the time when we get done with our vacations and we get back home, I'm like, wow, we have maximized our experience on that vacation. Because my wife is a planner. She plans on it. When we built a house a couple years ago, we didn't just go to the land and just dig a hole and be like, okay, we're going to build it this way. No, we had plans that we worked through, and it changed multiple times throughout the process. Before we even moved any dirt, we had a plan for the house. And just like going on vacation with the plan, just like building a house with the plan, it's the same way with our giving. We have to plan on it and stick to it. Because most of the time, our our response, our our approach to generosity is is spontaneous. But the thing is, if if that's our response or our our plan for for being generous, it's spontaneous. We'll never be great at being generous. There's a big difference between giving and being generous. You see, giving is what we do, and generous is who we are. Giving is what we do, and generous is who we are. Giving is the act Generosity is the heart and the mindset. So to be generous, we have to have a plan. And when you plan, you overcome your selfish mindset. And when we plan, we stick to it. And so for the rest of the day, I want to look at at, at three things, what it means to be a generous person, what it looks like to be a generous person. And how can we plan to begin a life of generosity? The first thing about a generous person, the quality of a generous person is this, is generous people give willingly. Generous people give willingly. Look back at verse 10 of, of, of 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And here's my judgment about what is best for you in this matter. Last year, you were the first not only to give, but also have the desire to do so. You wanted to. You had the desire to do it, then unfortunately you didn't follow through. Verse 11, now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it. Paul is saying to the church, close the gap between your intentions, your desires, and your actions of follow through according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has not to what one does not have. God is not just concerned with the amount. He's concerned with the heart. Sometimes we can give with the wrong hearts. Sometimes somebody can give a large gift with the wrong heart, and that's not generous at all. Other people can give a small gift but have the right motives, and that is the most generous. So when you give, we must give with the right heart, not to relieve some type of guilt. And, and I, I, I truly understand. I knew that when we were stepping into this series, my intention is not to bring guilt upon people, but to look at God's word. What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? And how do we relate to money and giving as a follower of Jesus Christ? And so I, I don't, I'm, I'm, I don't want to heap guilt on you and you, you be like, well, the pastor said I have to give, so now I'm going to give. No, that is not my desire at all. We're not calling you to give more. We're calling you to follow what God has called you to. Again, God has blessed us richly in this season. I'm overwhelmed and amazed by your generosity. But God, I, I, I truly believe that, that we're missing something when we're not following God's commands when it comes to all of what he gives to us. And so it's, we're, we're not calling you to relieve guilt in your giving. We don't want you to, to just make you feel better. We don't want you to, to impress people, to post on social media, look, look at me, how generous I am. But in our giving, we honor God and we bless others. Paul writes on later in chapter 9, verse 7, Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, 
not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. When we give from the heart, it isn't that I have to. It isn't out of reluctance, but it's that, that I realize how generous God has been to me, that everything that I have, that he has given to me, and I can't help but be generous back to him. I can't help be generous back to other people. I believe that God has blessed me so much that I can't help but give and be a blessing to others. So the first, so the first one is that generous people give willingly. The second is generous people give proportionately. They give in proportion to what they have. You see, one person can give $10 and be incredibly generous because it, 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 they don't have much, and another person can give 10000 and not be generous at all. So rich that they don't even miss it. And Paul says again in verse 11, Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. I like what verse 11 says in NLT. Give in proportion to what you have. Give in proportion to what you have. Give in proportion what God has trusted you. If it's little, give in proportion. If it's a lot, give in proportion. Paul is teaching in the New Testament and Old Testament principle. And we looked at last week this principle of the tithe. The reason that a lot of times that we don't see the, the principle of the tithe in the New Testament is because it becomes so ingrained in culture. It becomes so ingrained in their faith journey that we don't see it overtly in the New Testament. But as I began to study these last few weeks, I began to see the pr- process, the principle of the tithe over and over. And Paul is simply saying this, prioritize your portion. We see it all over the New Testament, and now we're beginning to see it, or all over the Old Testament, now we're beginning to see it in the New Testament. We read in Leviticus chapter 27, a tithe of everything from the land, whether grain for soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. The Bible says in many different places that we return the tithe back to God. 10% that we trust, that he's entrusted to us, we give back. And as we talked about last week, some, some of us were saying, well, I, I, just, I just don't think I can. I don't think I can give back 10% back to God. Things are so tight now, I just don't see if it's possible. But in order for us to prioritize our portion, to give the, the tithe that God has called us to, we have to rearrange our lives around God. That means everything. You see, the call of a disciple of Jesus is to rearrange everything about our life around who God is and who Jesus has called us to be. I rearrange my my marriage. I rearrange my parenting. I rearrange my sexuality. I rearrange my calling. I rearrange my career. I rearrange my habits. But sometimes we stop right there. And we're, and we're like, well, God's making concession that, that I don't have to rearrange how I handle my finances. But the call of a disciple, the call to surrender is to rearrange everything about our life to him. That is the call. And we have to prioritize everything in our life around God, including, including our finances. Paul is saying this about prioritizing our portion in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2. It says, on the first day of every week, there's another concept that we see of the tithe. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income. It's at the first. As we looked at last week, it's the first of our wealth. It's the highest of, of our earnings of that week. It's a, a, a predetermined sum of money that we give. To be generous. It's the decision before the decision. It's not in the moment, am I, am I going to give? But a decision, hey, at the very first, the very first thing that I'm going to do with, with the, the highest earn of my, of my wealth, of when I, when I get my paycheck, when, I, when it's deposited into my account, the very first thing, it goes back to God. 
And as I said last week, those, those are kind of ingrained in me as a kid to give a predetermined portion to the church. And for us as, as a family, for Lisa and I, it's always been the tithe. So every single week, the very first thing that we do is we give 10% back to the church. It's not because I'm a pastor. It's not because I'm employed by the church. It's because I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, and he's called me to be generous in these things. And we are seeing and experiencing life change happen within this faith community. So we willingly give to what God is doing. We're not asking you to do something that we're not ourselves willing to do. We saw this within our, our lives very early on in our marriage. When Lisa and I were first married, as I said last week, we had nothing. We, we were taught to do a budget. We stopped doing a budget because it, it never matched. Like We were like, how are we making it happen? We, we just did not know. Uh, both of us were full-time students, and we both had part-time jobs. And part-time is probably a stretch. Uh, she worked on campus. I worked loading uh, FedEx trucks. Um, and Hamburger Helper was our friend. Just laying out there. I don't know if we would have survived without Hamburger Helper. Uh, the first year we did our taxes, uh, we got back a, a fairly significant portion back. Uh, it was almost two weeks of our income. And we were like, wow. We, we were like uh, amazed at what we were giving back. And, and so we, we, we asked this question, do we give a tithe of our tax return? Do we give a tithe or a tax return? Uh, we decided that God had called us to do that. And so that Sunday morning, we wrote a check to the Wesleyan Church that we were going to at the time. And let me tell you, it was a significant amount that we could have had a really nice date night. No more hamburger helper for that day. We could have gone out and enjoyed. It was a significant amount that we gave. Fast forward a month. I know I've used this example, I think, before. I had interned at a church in Iowa, and uh, we were visiting Lisa's folks, and it was close, and so we went to the church and visited there. And, and uh, after service, a guy uh, reached out his hand to shake my hand, and I reached out, and it's one of those handshakes. I don't know, hopefully, you've gotten some of these in your life that you know there's something between your hands. You're like, hmm, there's something there. You're not quite sure, so you grab it and you put it in your pocket. After church, I pulled it out of my pocket, and it was the exact amount that we'd given to the church. That next day, I think we stuck around for a day or two, and Lisa had a doctor's appointment. And so she went to the doctor that she'd been seeing for, for years. And, and there was a lady that was the nurse of that doctor who went to the same church. So we developed a relationship with them. And before Lisa left, the, the nurse said, hey, I want to, God had called me to give you something. And so she hands her a check, and it was the exact amount that we'd given to the, the church. I'm not saying it's always going to work out that way. But Lisa and I were on our own. We were making adult decisions. And we come to a crossroad. Are we going to trust God with the tithe? And we made that decision. Man, it would be really nice. We haven't gone on a date for a long time. We've eaten a lot of hamburger helper. Maybe we can go grab a burger somewhere else. We decided to give. And it reaffirmed in us the blessing that God wants to give to us. And as we talked about last week, that when God supplies and we give first to him, God, God, when we make it a priority, God will multiply. It doesn't mean multiply financially, but maybe in relationships, in the things that we are going through. Maybe there's a peace that he gives to us. God will, and, so, so, and then when God does that, it builds our faith. And we didn't just see that when we were young in marriage and when we just didn't have a whole lot. We have seen that over and over and over again. We've seen it even in our lives recently. That when we're generous to what God has called us to give, God wants to be faithful to us. God showed himself to be faithful in that moment. and He showed himself to be faithful in so many other times and has built our faith. But again, maybe for you, you're just like, I, 10%, I just don't know if I can do that. You're, you're even just overwhelmed with that idea. I'd like to give, but pastor, I just don't know if, if I can do 10% right now. 
And so sometimes we can become so overwhelmed with that thought is that we actually do nothing. And when we do that, we're actually training ourselves not to be generous. And we're saying, God, God, I don't trust you with my finances. But I want to encourage you into something today. Maybe you don't think you can give a tithe of 10%. Can, can I suggest to you, start somewhere? Start somewhere. Maybe today, you and your, your husband or your wife, you, you sit down and you're like, okay, we can't give 10, but let's do 3%. At the very beginning of the week, we're gonna, we're, we commit, it's a decision, it's a decision, we're going to give 3%. Maybe you could say, hey, we can, I can do 5%. I am going to trust God with the predetermined amount that I am going to, in, 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 to give to him. And as God builds your faith, I just encourage you to begin to get to the place where you can be generous. Again, I'm not asking for your money. God's blessed us as a church. But I know if we're not generous, there's so much blessing that we're not receiving from the Father. Because we're holding back to him. We're never accidentally going to be generous. Generous people grow in their generosity as they plan to be generous. So generous people will give willingly. Generous people give proportionally. And the next one can probably be the most difficult one is generous people give sacrificially. Generous people give sacrificially. They give what makes them comfortable. We give what it makes us easy. We give what we don't really think we're going to miss, and we really don't feel it. But there's a powerful story in, of Jesus and, and Mark, a story of a poor widow who gave sacrificially. I, I, tr- I believe we study it in the Gospel of Mark when we went through it. Mark chapter 12, it says this. Watch, it, watch, watch what Jesus does. I, I'm blown away. I don't know why I ca- didn't catch this before, but I caught it this week. Jesus sat down opposite the plate where the offering was put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasure. That is a sobering thought right there. Jesus actively went into the the, the temple, the church, sat across from the giving box and watched what people gave. If I did that, you'd probably fire me. But Jesus did it. It says that many rich people threw a large amount, threw in a large amount. But a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. And it says, he calls his disciples to him, Jesus said, and Jesus said, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They gave all, they all gave out of their wealth, out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all that she had to live on. It's an attitude of the heart. The religious people, that they, they gave because they could. They gave because it was easy. They weren't being generous, but Jesus was saying, this small gift was, excuse me, was the most generous gift. It's a sobering thought. Many of you are like the widow. You're so generous with your resources. You're so generous with your time and your energy, and you're faithfully to give back to God and to trust Him with what He has given to you and, and others, not so much. Every year, uh, we, if you're new to FSN, if you've been around a while, you already know this, but every year we, we, we pick an Advent giving project. Uh, this past year, uh, we did both a local and a global missions organization, we, CORE, and then uh, uh, Costia with uh, Oasis Ag. And, and as a church, we commit, uh, just right along with you guys, to commit to give above our tithe. So we give a tithe to the storehouse, we give a tithe to the church, and then what we give to missions is above and beyond our tithe. So every single week, Lisa and I, we give to missions. We give to global mission, but particularly during the Advent season, we, we give a, a, a larger portion to that. And each week, we challenge you to give to th- this, this particular missions organization. A few years ago, I think actually two years ago, we, we looked at the James Project. It's a, it's 
the project that helps uh, orphans and widows in Kenya, or in, in Africa, I think it's Kenya, in Africa. And, and uh, our goal was to raise enough money to buy, uh, to build a tower, water tower. Well, you guys were so generous, we actually built three that year. Kevin Stark, he's uh, part of our church, he's a friend of mine, uh, a, uh, a grandize, he's uh, the president of that. And so he's traveling to Africa today, and he sent me a picture this week telling us what your generosity did. I want to introduce you to a woman named Carol. This is Carol with uh, three of her children. Four years ago, Carol's husband passed away, uh, with, and she had no means to provide for herself or, her, or for her family. And th- there was times in which they would go days without any kind of food. And out of the love of a mother... She did something that many of us would, would, would find horrific, but she, she sold herself so that she would have enough means for her kids to have food to eat. And through one of these relationships, she actually now has a fourth child. So now she's taking care of, of, of four kids with no means, with no skills, and she, she's having to continually sell herself so, just, so they just have enough to survive. Well, recently she encountered a, an organization called the James Project. And now she is able to provide meals for her kids. Her kids have the opportunity to get an education. And she is learning the skills to begin to provide for herself. You see, when you and I give sacrifice, our story, her story is part of our story. Because you guys gave to that. You guys sacrificially gave to that. The James Project. And we're hearing stories of lives being transformed by the renewing of God's Spirit because of your generosity. We never, we never fully received a blessing other than stories of what we've been told. Of how God is changing lives because of your giving. And so if you gave to that project two years ago, Carol's story is your story. Give sacrificially. So I want to ask you today, when was the last time you gave sacrificially? When was the last time you gave sacrificially? When was the last time you gave, and when you gave it, you're like, hmm, That would be really nice to have, but God has called me to give this. For some of us, it may be more difficult to give sacrificially because God has blessed us with a lot. But for some of us, maybe it's just a small gift. But again, it's not about the amount. It's about the heart behind the generosity. And God is not asking you to do what he was not willing to do himself. See, when we are away from God, when our hearts were chasing other things, God gave his son, his only son, to die for you and for me, to give us what he has entrusted so that we may trust him. And so when it comes to our generosity, when it comes to our money, God never said be great at spending on yourself. God never said to be great at finding the best deals. Not, God never said to store up treasures on earth where moths and rust destroy. But he did say to be great at storing up treasures in heaven. Be great at giving. Giving is spiritual. Excel in the ministry of giving. Paul is saying to the church in Corinth, now finish the ministry of giving that you have started. You're great at so many different things. Be great at generosity. And watch as God opens up the floodgates upon your life. Because we serve a generous God, when we understand the generous the generosity that He's given to us, let me tell you guys, I can't help but give of my resources, of my time, of my energy, of what God has given to me. 
because I realize how much of a good God and a good father he is. We serve a generous God. We serve a God that wants to be generous to you, and we serve a God who has already been generous. Because we all know that God loved you so much that he gave his one and only son. And that when you believe in him, you will have life abundantly. A life that is above anything you ever imagined. That he'll provide your needs. Not all your wants, but he'll provide your needs. So that you and I can have a life eternal with him. Again, this is just a two-week series. I don't think we can do like a 20-week series on generosity. I think we can handle two. And my prayer is, is that we fully receive what God's Word says to us. That as disciples of Jesus, as followers of Jesus, when we've said yes to Him, we've surrendered, we've surrendered everything else. But sometimes we can hold back that one thing. Man, guys, we're missing it. When I'm not generous, when God calls me to be generous in those moments, I mean, I'm missing something in my life. Because God is calling us as his followers to be generous. And so my desire and my prayer is that we begin to live a life that's so generous out in, in this body so generous that we live that out in our community that people begin to see the goodness of God. Because God has been good to us. Maybe you're here today, maybe FS, this is your first time at FSM, you're like, does pastors always preach on money? No, it just happens about twice a year. We just happen to land here today. But maybe you come today and you realize the, the love of God for you you realize that God has provided so much for you that you, there's a sense, there's a pulling, there's a tug of, within your spirit towards the Father. It's the Holy Spirit speaking to you today. And he's asking you to step into a relationship with him. To say yes to the life that he has for you, to surrender your, your desires and your dreams. To surrender your life, your hopes, your goals. And let me tell you, he return, I've seen it over and over again, guys, that he returns it back to you tenfold. Not monetarily, just the blessings of life. And he has that for you today. So I just say to you, man, if that's you today, just cry out to the Father. Say, God, forgive me. I've sinned against you. I say yes to you today. I say yes to you right now. And one of the things that we, our heartbeat here at FSN is have conversations with people of what it means to follow Jesus Christ. If that's you today, and you're curious, or maybe you've, you've given your life to Jesus, there's a card in front of you. We want you to fill that out, put in the black box, because we want to have a conversation with you of what it means to follow Jesus. There's nothing greater than that. So God, this morning, Lord, I believe that there are, are one or two in here today that, God, they've walked their own path. They've been kings of their own kingdom. They realize that, that, God, that life is meaningless without you. And so they're saying yes to you right now. They're saying yes to the relationship. They're saying yes to the life that you have. And so, God, we just, we just pray for them, Lord, right now. If that's you, just cry out to God and say, God, forgive me. Forgive me my sins. Maybe be specific in some of the sins that you've committed against him. God, I give you my life. I repent of my sins. I desire to follow you. And we want to have a relationship and we want to journey with you as you begin this new relationship with Jesus. But maybe for some of us today, we've sat in church for years. We've said yes to you in so many different areas that, God, we're holding back this, this one area from you. 
that you call us to. God, as we walk this journey of being a disciple of you, you've called us to this journey to give, to be generous. And so I pray for them today. God, I've seen you faithful so many times. I just, God, I, I, even, there's no question or doubt in my mind what you give. God, I want them to get to that point where there's, there's no question or no doubt in their mind of the goodness of God that they just can't help but give to you. So God, I thank you for today. I thank you for this church. I thank you for these times that, that we encounter you, that we pursue Jesus. That God, that we can go out and make an impact on this world. So God, I thank you for today. I thank you for your truth. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the Apostle Paul speaking truth into our lives today. Through your word, we thank you, Father. Your son's incredible and powerful name that we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.